Good day, everyone. This is Hira Burhan, broadcasting live from Karachi, Pakistan. Today, we are presenting the first ACNS Women in Neurosurgery Online Symposium. Uh, it is a pleasure to have with us renowned neurosurgeons from around the world. Um, today, we start off with a brief introduction from Professor Franco Cervedi. He is uh, the leader of the World Federation of Neurological Surgeons. He has a few introductory words to be said to all the females pursuing neurosurgery. Um, please share, and I would request the other participants to please mute their microphones so that we do not have any interruptions during the video. I start with my screen share, and we have Professor Franco with us. It's my pleasure to address a few words for the Women in Neurosurgery Online Symposium organized by the Asian Congress of Neurosurgery. Women are extremely important in many medical activities. Uh, a balance between women and men is the balance, for, good balance for the society, for any work, also for us as surgeons. Uh, the recent number of women increased tremendously among the trainees. In Europe now, in the last three years, they equalized the number of men. So, in some parts of the world at the moment, the number of neurosurgeons is shared equally between women and men. Obviously, still there are countries in which we need improvements, but we need also to not have prejudice. Women have more problems with the families, but they can be strong worker as men, and they can become skillful neurosurgeons. Even the ruling of the world in the World Federation, the AC, the Administrative Council, contains two women as a part of the ruling body of the World Federation. We still have a long way to equalize these numbers and to include more women among the neurosurgical community. But we are on march and these meetings will surely improve the quality of the participation of our women in the neurosurgical community. The skillfulness is the same. They are even stronger men and they are more empathic to our patients. So we need to include them as an important part of our community. With our best wishes, with my personal best wishes for a very free community. That was Professor Franco Cervedi. He is the head of World Federation of Neurological Societies. We thank him for his time and his precious words. We proceed with our first presenter, Professor Isabel Giannano. She is a professor of neurosurgery and oncological services, director of comprehensive brain tumor program, and co-director of pediosurgery program at Mount Sinai Health System, New York. She will be talking about the trend in female neurosurgical residency in the US. Professor Giannano, it's all yours now. Good morning. Thank you very much for uh, including me in this uh, great uh, event. I um, really think that uh, Hira should be congratulated for uh, putting this uh, symposium together. It's a great uh, opportunity for women from all over the world to get together and hopefully to inspire one another and to learn from one another. Uh, I am very thankful to Professor Sarvade, who is the uh, uh, chair of the um, World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies at, for his uh, great introduction. I serve as the uh, chair for education for the uh, WFNS, and I hope to meet um, all of you and some of you I already met through, um, throughout the next uh, few years in the educational activities uh, that we do. Today, I was asked to speak about uh, women in neurosurgical residency in the United States. I uh, practice and live in uh, New York, United States, and clearly cannot uh, uh, go any farther without first uh, thanking Professor Yoko Kato, who uh, is the inspiration to all of us, who has been leading us and uh, has been a fantastic uh, uh, educator for all women and men in neurosurgery. So Professor Yoko Kato, thank you. 
And Haira, thank you again for this uh, great effort. Women in medicine in the United States go a long way back. The first uh, woman who received a medical degree in the US was Elizabeth Blackwell in 1849. Uh, at that time, her degrees were at the uh, Geneva, New, New York Medical College. In those days, in the uh, 1880s, uh, there were uh, also uh, uh, women societies that were not restricted to uh, alumni. And the first one was organized in 1887. And you can see here the historical picture of Blackwell's Medical Society of Rochester with uh, a few women part of that. In uh, the 80s, there was just a handful of women physicians. In 1915, there were 9,000 women, uh, meaning 5% of all uh, medical doctors in the U.S. Uh, were women. And uh, at the same time, there was the American Association of uh, Women in Medicine that started because they realized that the path uh, of leadership needed to include women. So if you think about it, this is exactly... 103 years ago. Um, in uh, 1928, the women in medicine declined, and you see that uh, it went uh, from uh, uh, 6% to uh, 5%. Uh, and because of that decline, uh, there were uh, several initiatives, including one that was called So You Want to Be a Doctor, where women were trying to inspire each other to become physicians. In the 60s, there is the women movement that is uh, uh, addressing several issues, uh, including the disparities in pay. For instance, in the United States, uh, uh, women uh, at that time were making uh, 50 cents uh, over a dollar compared to men. And clearly, uh, financial disparity was not the main focus of the women movement, but was, was uh, an important one. And there was an increase in um, uh, women in medical uh, school from 1961 to 71, from 6% to 11%. However, in those days, uh, fewer women continue to practice after training. And so the two main questions are, uh, does the role of a mother and a wife possibly pose a barrier to the practice? Or are there any other uh, factors that could discourage women from practicing in medicine? And then a few years later, in 1989, a few of us um, got together and started a group called Women in Neurosurgery. I was honored to be president uh, of such group in 1993. And our goal was really uh, to uh, inspire, encourage women neurosurgeons, women in training to become neurosurgeons, and students that potentially could be interested in our uh, professional uh, career. And in 2014, our group, Women in Neurosurgery, became a full, fully acknowledged uh, section, uh, the joint section of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and Congress of Neurological Surgeons. And you can see the mission on the slide. Basically, we want to be sure that um, uh, interaction among women surgeons uh, throughout the world uh, are uh, enhanced. And so this uh, symposium that we have today is really great and fulfills our goals. Now, in the, in the present time, as we have heard from Professor Servaday, things are different. In the United States, approximately 50% of medical school class are women. And uh, um, it is uh, important uh, to uh, uh, recognize that uh, after you're done with the uh, medical school, you need to really uh, understand what you want to do. And we will review this in our last slide uh, as well. But what happened, right, to uh, uh, women that are in medical school? What kind of specialties do they usually uh, pursue, at least in, uh, in the United States? Well, 18 specialties have more than 1,000 women physicians. Um, and uh, the, the top five specialties are internal medicine, pediatrics, general uh, practice, um, OBGYN, and uh, psychiatry, right? And this represents approximately 83 of all women in medicine. So you have not seen the word neurosurgery in the top five specialties. In um, uh, the United States, to become a neurosurgeon, first you go to high school, then you go to college, then you go to medical school, then you do a, a neurosurgery residency, and the length of this is usually six to seven years. And then uh, if you want to, you can do a fellowship, which is a subspecialty within the neurosurgery field. 
When you're done with all that, we have two possibilities. Either you stay in academia or you go into private practice. Um, and here are the uh, uh, women that we uh, acknowledge as, uh, as leading um, the field. Uh, Ruth uh, Jacoby was the first uh, uh, woman uh, in neurosurgery in the United States, and she also continued on with a degree in uh, jurisprudence. Uh, I think, guys, sorry, that this presentation that I have loaded here is not my uh, most uh, recent one. And uh, so uh, I, uh, I apologize. Uh, there is nothing that I said uh, that is different than what I will tell you. <laughs> but I will go uh, move on onto this one that has more up, uh, updated slides. OK. And so that is the slide we were just uh, reviewing. So let's look at uh, women in uh, neurosurgery residency uh, in the United States, right? Um, women represents approximately 46% of all um, medical um, uh, residents. However, for uh, neurosurgery, at least uh, in, in this day and ages, women are only 16% of uh, neurosurgical residency. And uh, here you can see the graph on the slide showing how the trend has been for women in neurosurgery. And this was also described in our original uh, paper uh, back uh, uh, several years ago. Now, there has been over the past 10 years an increasing number of uh, uh, graduating women from neurosurgery residency. And at the bottom of the screen here, you can see, in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, the graphs uh, for, the, for, the, for the past uh, 10 years showing uh, such uh, an increase. Now, um, the original graph uh, was uh, published uh, showing uh, from the very beginning of our uh, neurosurgery existence as women in neurosurgery uh, to uh, uh, 2010. And here is really the last 10 years and we, sh we show that there has been uh, an increase. Now, as said before, since uh, 2005, approximately 50% of medical students are uh, women. And this graph shows it very nicely where uh, we are approaching equality in medical school. However, in neurosurgery, we remain not really equal, right? So there has been an increase uh, from 8% to 10% to 16. Uh, one could be very optimistic in saying that between 89 and 2016, we doubled, which is great. But look at what is happening to after residency. This is the American Board of Neurological Surgeons. And, and that is a qualification that we need in the United States after we finish residency to become board certified neurosurgeons. And if you compare the last 10 years, 20, 2006 and 2016 has been a flat line, really flat. OK, and in fact, in this last paper that we just published, you can see that um, it's even even more uh, uh, discouraging because indeed it looks like we're going back. Right. So this is the number of certified women in neurosurgery. And you can see here um, from uh, 2000 to 2010 and here it will be uh, from uh, 2011 to 2016, even less. So either we're staying the same or we're actually getting a bit less. So what, what are the reasons for that? And clearly this in this talk, we're not going to cover them all. And in the rest of the day, uh, you will hear more about this. Uh, but the data is pretty strong. The data shows um, that uh, we are very few in the United States that uh, are uh, able to accomplish board certification, right? And uh, um, I think that there are two very important things. One is uh, recruitment to the field, but the other one is to be retained. And so what we looked at in one of our papers uh, is the attrition. In this figure here that we published, you see the attrition rate of um, residents. And you can see that uh, actually the uh, women have... Uh, a, uh, an attrition uh, um, uh, rate that is uh, uh, higher, right? And uh, when you look at this, um, you see that uh, the same thing, this is the percentage of matched applicant from 1990 to 1989 who are ABNS certified. So you see here also that although uh, to start with there are 
uh, women and men, but that men continue on to become certified and we don't. Um, and here is another, it's another graph uh, showing the attrition number this time is organized by uh, gender throughout the residency. So you see that, that the years where uh, women and men are more likely to drop out of residency, it's really the first uh, three years. And then as we move along, uh, it's, it's less, uh, less likely. And it, clearly there are many, many uh, reasons. And I don't think that we have enough data to uh, support uh, those reasons, but at least uh, we can think along the line, those lines. And during the day, uh, the symposium uh, will, will focus us more on what could those reasons be, right? And so what we did was wondering what happened to those women that drop out of neurosurgical re residency. And, and uh, when I say drop out, it's, it's a very gray sentence and I want to keep it that way because in my country and mm, possibly in other countries as well. If you quote unquote um, uh, voluntarily resign, you don't have to report it and uh, it's much easier to find something else to do uh, that if quote unquote you're asked to leave. So it, it, it is um, legally a very uh, gray zone. But in any event, so we followed in this paper, we followed those women that no longer were in neurosurgery residency. And what is interesting is, is that they stay, right, by and large, they stay within the medical profess profession. Uh, so these are not women that are going out of the field because they, they decide that they want to pursue something else. Uh, the vast majority stays uh, within neurosurgery. And, as, and you see, in fact, in this pie that non-medical were only 5%. So this is something uh, to think about um, hardly as we, as we try to improve our situation. And this picture I put on uh, just to remind us that um, a lot of what's going on in life um, for women is based on unconscious bias. And I think that uh, the panelists today and our, other, our audience is very well aware of what unconscious bias is and what unconscious bias does uh, to women. To the point where in other fields, like for instance, music, um, now, audition sometimes can be uh, performed uh, blind to the gender, and the musician is performing behind the screen. And this uh, article is asking a very interesting question. Could we replicate this in business, right? And I would like to raise the same question. Could we replicate this in neurosurgery? Uh, and it is a tough one to answer because uh, clearly after we train, um, we assume that uh, men and women are, are the same. And I would uh, kind of pose that if you showed a video of uh, one of us uh, performing surgery, and then uh, you put the, the, another video performing similar surgery of a man, uh, it would be very tough uh, for, uh, for, for um, an, um, people that are auditioning us to uh, uh, say which one is uh, best. Uh, nonetheless, if they showed uh, who is doing what, uh, maybe that unconscious, unconscious bias would play a role and, uh, and possibly the man and not the woman would get the job. So it's, it's kind of interesting that in our profession, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to replicate uh, auditioning uh, um, uh, behind the screen. But it's interesting that in other industries, this has been done and has been successfully done, once again, proving that that unconscious bias could definitely uh, play a big role. So um, for students, right, get in the door. 52% of medical school class are women, and I'm sure that in other countries, numbers are uh, in favor of women as well. Um, what uh, would I recommend? First of all, choose a specialty. How do you choose a specialty? Uh, it is important to have contact time with uh, um, doctors, uh, mentors in, in your um, university that you think are important. Finding a mentor is crucial because it's only by uh, mentorship, through mentorship, that we understand uh, what we need and that we can focus. And then if you really want to be a neurosurgeon, uh, do it because uh, you know that it can be done. You know that we Women can do it. And for what I am concerned, I think that following uh, your passion is the most important thing in life. 
And with this, I would like to thank you again for uh, inviting me to be part of this great uh, symposium. I had uh, disclosed at the uh, beginning that I have to uh, catch a flight. And so unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to stay for the rest. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing this online um, in the next uh, days. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Gimano. Uh, and I would like, it was a wonderful um, insight towards the neurosurgical residency in the US. I would like to uh, ask Umaima to introduce herself. She is a new a panelist. Umaima, please introduce yourself to the uh, speakers. Hello, I'm Umaima, a medical student from Baghdad in neurosurgery. And uh, I'm really happy that I'm sharing this with you today. Thank you. And uh, does anyone have any questions on the panel or any comments for Professor Isabel? Okay, I guess we don't. And Professor Isabel has also uh, left. So we proceed with our next speaker. And uh, she is uh, Dr. Divya Palinsami. She's a consultant neurosurgeon at Sri Narayan Hospital and Research Center, Velour, Tamil Nadu. Uh, these days, she's currently doing her fellowship in Japan with Professor Kato, and she will be talking about 10 points to overcome struggles during your surgical residency. Professor De Dr. Devra, please come. OK. So hi. Uh, I welcome everyone uh, for this great event. And uh, I'm Dr. Devya Parlani Sami from uh, Tamil Nadu, India. I thank uh, Professor Yoko Kato for giving me this opportunity to talk in front of you. And uh, uh, special congratulations to Dr. Hira, who, is, who initiated this program and successfully running this. Congratulations, Hira. So I'm from India. So my practice is from India. So I have a short experience of a neurosurgical uh, practice. Like I finished in 2015, my five years of residency. And now I'm practicing as a consultant for the past two years. So whatever uh, I, I felt will be useful for the residents. So I'm going to uh, tell today. I'm screen sharing. Yes, you are screen sharing. Um, you need to minimize this and go to your PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, yeah. Yes, doing that. Sweet. So I'm going to talk about the points or ways how you can uh, like overcome your struggles during uh, your residency, especially for the residents. And uh, so the first point is be armed to face the battle. So do not think I'm discouraging you or uh, threatening you. But I have to tell you the truth. And uh, I don't want to hide the truth. And it's my duty as a young female neurosurgeon to uh, prime you for what you are going to encounter during the residency, neurosurgical residency, and what you ex can expect from the residency and what you are expected during your program. So um, means in India, the population is 1.34 billion as per the census uh, in 2016. There are only 2,500 certified neurosurgeons available. So if you take the ratio, there is one neurosurgeon per 0 0.43 million. That is 4.3 lakh population. So imagine the load of the patients you are going to have and face during your residency program in the institutes and teaching institutes. You may not have uh, enough sleep. Uh, you may have to work for uh, more than 36 hours continuously without any sleep. You may not have enough means good food because you might be staying in the hostel. So lots of practical difficulties are there. But if you are armed, that is with dedication, passion for neurosurgery and involvement, you will be able to succeed um, in this battle. It's not a real battle where you may not know whether you will win or not. But in this, like all this uh, means dedication and passion, you will be able to complete your residency. So. But this battle is only during the residency, not after that. Life is entirely different once you complete your residency. The second point I want to make is catch hold of the supporters. Do not expect good support from the faculties, uh, all the faculties in your department. I mean, if it happens, that is well and good. I appreciate it. But it's not so. There, for example, if you there are if there are 
10 faculties in a department, two will be discouraging you to the core. You may feel like quitting the residency because of those two. There'll be another two who will encourage you. But to get a good impression from those supporters, you may have to work hard and you have to show that you are very sincere. You may have to spend more time in the hospital and the operating room. But if you get good impression from those supporters, they will come for your life. They will help you in your growth. And uh, so in this regard, I would like to mm -hmm. thank my mentor, Professor K.R. Suresh Bapu, Dr. Rupesh Kumar, and Dr. Siddharth Ghosh. They uh, still help me in every walk of my life and career. And there will be another six out of 10. They will not uh, care about your growth. At the same time, they will not hinder your growth. So just don't care about those who do not care about your growth or those who discourage you. But catch hold of those two supporters. And that's very important. The third point is do not be sensitive and do not take anything personal. Being women, like we are more sensitive, but to do neurosurgical residency and to succeed, you should not be sensitive. You should have the proper attitude. Because most of the older neurosurgeons in, in India, like they think, means they have a misconception that being rude and tough to a student makes him more and more strong. And they think that one, the one who uh, overcomes this rudeness and means toughness, like they become a successful neurosurgeon. But in reality, it's not so. Many leave the course because of this rudeness. But the younger generations, younger generation of faculties, they are not treating, they are um, good to the students. So the trend is changing. So do not <laughs> worry about, means you may have to uh, meet with someone in your department like this, but just don't care, just move on, ignore them. Once you complete your residency, they will not treat you like this, they will give you respect. The fourth point, do not let anyone judge you. I want to share my experience uh, during my residency. Uh, I, I was unfortunate to have two mentors, two faculties who discouraged me. And they were in power. One used to uh, tell on my face every day, every day when he sees me for the first time. And he used to tell that he will make sure that no female enters the department hereafter. And the other used to yell at me in the department in front of the patients, or for that matter, anyone, means using abusing words. And uh, he used to tell, I'm worthless to become a neurosurgeon. One of my colleagues, he told that I was not confident of, I means I was not looking confident of doing a surgery. So like uh, that's why I was forbidden from surgical chances. At one point of time, I started to believe their opinion about me. So I quit the residency during my third year of residency. But I started to think what went wrong. Is it, the, is it the fault of a student or the mentor? So actually, if a student is not looking confident, if a student is a failure, then it's the duty of the mentor to motivate and train. I am baffled to see the assistant professors in Japan in every university to sit beside the residents and teaching each and every step of the neurosurgery. I was really shocked to see that. So, and neurosurgery is not preferred by many. So only few joints. It is, then it is the utmost duty of a mentor to motivate the student. So I rejoined. Now I'm doing quite a good of surgeries. Yes, I have to subspecialize. I have to train myself more and more, but still I am able to give good neurosurgical service to my community with very good outcomes. So what I mean to tell is learning is a process which can happen at any time at your wish. So do not let anyone judge about your skills. Fifth is perseverance and patience. This is very, very important for a neurosurgeon to have. So uh, for example, see this child, the child is trying to climb the staircase. So you are not an adult to begin with in the residency, you are a child. You have to understand that. It will take time. The child will take time to learn how to climb. But by the time it reaches the top, it would have grown 
become an adult knowing all the techniques of how to climb faster it takes time but so neurosurgery is also like that to master neurosurgical skills it takes time it may take 5 years 10 years or 15 years so be patient and be perseverant because 5 years of this residency means hardship will give you the happiness and satisfaction of being a neurosurgeon for the rest of your life so be perseverant be patient sixth point is help each other be united never pull down anyone so if you <laughs> women are minority in the field of neurosurgery so in if you take the history the struggles and the needs of the minority was or is never understood by the majority so the strength of the minority relies on its unity so be united help each other you take one of your juniors teach them mentor them and never ever try to pull anyone down means it it it, it is applicable to both men and women but especially don't try to pull down another woman it's not going to take you anywhere and if you grow as an individual that will stop at one point and it is not of great use to the society but when you grow along with the society that will take you higher and higher also the society so help each other be united never pull down anyone the seventh point is gender discrimination yes it is still there but it is getting lesser if you take the life history of professor kanaka the first asian lady neurosurgeon from india she was not allowed to um, enter the operating room or watch the surgery even during the emergencies she cannot scrub and she was failed five times in the general surgery so but that cannot happen nowadays time has changed the other point is how come a discrimination gender discrimination can come down that is by increasing the number of women neurosurgeons when the number of women neurosurgeons becomes more than 40 or 50% of the total neurosurgical population then the automatically the discrimination will go off so do not quit please join neurosurgical residency increase the number of women neurosurgeons so that in future we give good environment for our means juniors or future generations and uh, nowadays like there are so many women neurosurgical forums being formed in india korea brazil us japan and acns is also going to start its women in neurosurgery section so under one roof will become a majority and then we can fight against this so means do not worry about discrimination we are there for you so the eighth point is like when you feel lonely instead of quitting residency please get married so i have to tell about my friend and colleague dr disney joseph like she was a mother of an 8 month old child then she joined her residency and during fifth year of her residency she gave birth to another child so uh, but she succeeded well cleared everything in the first attempt and now she is doing her fellowship uh, in india in pediatric neurosurgery so whenever i used to tell her about my problems she used to advise divya get married then you will be diverted and you will know what to prioritize family or neurosurgery so family will come for your life after all neurosurgery is a profession so actually we pursue a profession to run our family happily if you run your fa- ha- family happily and then your profession will also means develop so actually if i think back most of my growth has happened after my marriage i had a good husband in laws and along with my family like i am able to give some growth have some growth so instead of quitting residency when you feel lonely and depressed please get married and i want to make another point please uh, means in india it's a common practice for women doctors to marry uh, a male doctor so but male doctors do not prefer women neurosurgeons much so ultimately what we want is a guy who can respect and accept you as you are with your career so my sincere advice from my experience is like get married to a person who accepts you as you are with your career so as dr isbella told like sub speciality i feel in my opinion i have not yet specialized but still i feel like sub speciality is the future so if uh, it's the, it's the uh, river with its branches if the river ends up uh, in the sea without any branch it's of no use so it has to 
subspecialize then it will fertilize more and more land so like that so what i uh, want the residents and young female neurosurgeons is to subspecialize to become a master and become an authority in a subspecialty that's how women can get some voice in future so sub, sub, please subspecialize so the 10th point is contribution so <laughs> we just forget about the contribution once we complete our neurosurgical residency we say like thank god get the hell out of this place i just want to i do not want to think about it but actually we have to contribute we do not want to pass on the same struggles we faced during our residency to our younger generation so we should feel responsible so this is a tree without any leaves it's dry so what you are going to do like you are going to feel sorry for that and just move on or you are going to take some action pour water and make it grow green so it's up to you so take the responsibility try to make some change reformation by being united and give the future generation a good comfortable neurosurgical residency and so so finally be ready be steady and grow so thank you and uh, neurosurgery is like uh, the banyan tree so branches are the subspecialities so ma be a, become a master authority in subspecialty and send your roots down to strengthen the neurosurgical field and uh, i this is the uh, uh, photograph uh, taken during our uh, uh, women in neurosurgery section of india inauguration in uh, on 17th december 2016 professor keto was invited as the chief guest and uh, she's professor kanaka uh, she's 85 years old now and she's the first asian lady neurosurgeon still into practice thank you thank you so much uh, thank you so much dr divya for your experience you. uh, it's true uh, i mean i come from pakistan too and it's very similar the conditions are very similar in both the countries and uh, 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 when your personal experience is quite similar to what we have here, most of the female neurosurgeons. Mm -hmm. But um, I believe things will change, and the younger generation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I want to like. Uh, professor keto uh, i am working with professor keto now like i am doing fellowship with her so professor wanted to uh, pass on uh, some messages uh, and she wants some discussion among the panelists so she wants to uh, give some recommendations shall i share it now or so oh, please yes go ahead yeah i i will do that so professor wanted to mention that uh, 5% of the neurosurgeons in japan are females and uh, she wanted to uh, pass on this recommendations from her like uh, um, we can um, increase the number of uh, neurosurgical residents we have to increase the recruitment of residents and uh, so that we can reduce the working hours and uh, we can increase the holidays we have to optimize the working environment and uh, if the number of uh, neurosurgical residents increases then we can uh, reduce uh, means we can increase the du uh, doctors doing duty during duty hours actually in our place we have hardly have one uh, duty doctor uh, means uh, on duty neurosurgeon uh, neurosurgical resident on duty it's it's very difficult so maybe if by increasing recruiting more residents we can appoint at least two or three residents so that the work load comes down and by increasing the stipend actually in india we get very very uh, less salary so especially for men uh, so it's very very difficult to uh, run the families with that siphon for 5 years on 6 years of residency so and uh, so madam uh, professor keto wants to make this point also and uh, during pregnancy and child rearing uh, like uh, the working system should be flexible and uh, if uh, someone takes leave like if we take leave that should be alternative doctors called from other universities like that some flexible arrangement should be made and uh, in hospital child care systems in india actually we do not have uh, in hospital or outside of the hospital child care systems only the grandparents take care of the children um, but here I, i think in japan they have lots of uh, child care systems but they want to develop further and uh, we can consider giving subsidy for uh, child care expenses 
So once someone leaves the course and joins back, I think uh, they should be supported. They should be accepted and, and then uh, supported. Uh, if uh, some means a duty exemption is given means on some special consideration, health consideration or those things, like uh, however, the student will lose the skills of uh, learning neurosurgery because during emergency only, we learn, we learn so much during residency. So professor uh, like put forward, like, uh, like if we can give allowance for increased duty hours, that will be great. That can attract students. Increasing the percentage of women involved in decision making, like in the societies, like only very less number of women or in power and uh, in, in India in the committee uh, in, in NSA committee actually we don't have any women representation we never had any uh, women neurosurgeon as uh, the uh, uh, secretary or the president or not even a neurosurgeon in the female neurosurgeon in the committee itself so at least means they should consider us like uh, getting into the committee and proper evaluation and promotion of personnel without gender discrimination is very important uh, and uh, gender equality education should start uh, from the elementary school and if possible we can spread this to uh, means our colleagues male colleagues also providing child care system during meetings and congresses will um, uh, means allow means will encourage women to uh, means attend the meetings actually many of our uh, women neurosurgeons colleagues who have children like they do not attend the meetings because of the uh, means responsibility of taking care of the children so having this kind of child care systems during the meetings and congresses will be helpful and uh, we have to increase the role women role models so that will also attract more women into neurosurgery thank you Divya, i have a small small hello yes can you hear me uh one minute i don't know you need to stop screen sharing and get back to the hangouts window uh okay okay uh, when you say okay. that uh, Conditions change. I mean, once you did a residency and once you complete, once you completed it, how were things different then after that with you? I mean, the attitudes and the conditions. Was there when I joined back, actually, when I uh, planned to quit, actually, so many counseled me. Actually, speaking, like all my consultants counseled me. Actually, that time. But uh, I was like unable to pursue, so I left. But uh, when I rejoined, fortunately, those who was that one person who was in power, actually, he he had some problem issues with the other one. So actually, I had some problem. I, I had some good time there. I was fortunate. And uh, I, I was supported by Dr. Siddhartha Ghosh. So he really encouraged me and helped me. But uh, I used to work hard. I changed my attitude. That's the main thing. I changed my attitude. I, I was not sensitive. That's the main point I want to make. Like Tisani, like my colleague, she was really, really, like she had the proper attitude. She was able to come up. But uh, I quit because I was so sensitive because I was not treated like that during my MBBS time. Uh, like that means I was not insulted in front of anyone or so. So that was, <laughs> I took it personally. So that's why I, made, I want to make the point. Do not be sensitive. Change your attitude. You will win. Thank you. And if there are any more questions from the panel, comment. Just congratulations. It's very tough comments. It was great. You are a brave woman. And uh, probably with your words, you may encourage more than a usual class or normal lecture because your experience uh, probably is uh, the same that more of the neurosurgeon in training have. And maybe is one of the answer that Isabella in the first talk are talking about. Uh, why did the women give up during the residency and still in medicine? There is something we can do about if we would try to catch these feelings, uh, maybe we can help others don't give up and mm -hmm. still and fight and still together and uh, more we increase uh, the women in residency in training uh, less we have uh, this kind of behavior it was acceptable maybe 20 years ago 40 years ago it was acceptable even in my country okay. but uh, it's not anymore we I'm need to, to be conscious it's important we can change ourselves, but we need to to know what our what is right, what is wrong. Mm -hmm. 
And if he's wrong, I know in neurosurgery, there is a lot of mechanism that uh, they can put the women away, uh, not in the real uh real situation but in subliminal way like you tell us uh, maybe she's not very skilled or maybe uh, she have some problems and uh, just uh, threw away is not more uh, acceptable not congratulations acceptable. fantastic <laughs> contribution you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Nelsi. <laughs> so, uh, what I feel is like, uh, if uh, our young uh, youngsters, young female neurosurgeons, if we can take one of the residents from any institute, uh, once they join, like mentor them, guide them, means that may reduce the attrition rate. That is what we have to look into. Means we need the neurosurgeons increase in number of the neurosurgeons. So, residency is the critical period. Whatever I feel is re residency is the critical period. Once you come out, adversity comes down. There are lots of opportunities. You can learn. You can uh, uh, means, uh, means train yourself. There are lots of opportunities. But that residency period is a critical one. That has to be uh, given more and more importance. Residents, uh, whatever the programs, women neurosurgery programs, whatever we have, I, I feel like we have to give moral support, boost, and mentor the residents. That's how we can reduce the attrition rate. So that's how we can increase the women neurosurgeons. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nelsi. Thank you so much. Thank you for your uh, experience. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, uh, we have to have Dr. Sharon with us, but unfortunately, she is having some trouble because she's uh, on a transit. Uh, so we'll continue our uh, symposium. And we have Dr. Sivleen Estesia with us from Indonesia. She's working at the Division of Neurospine, Peripheral Nerve and Pain at the Department of Neurosurgery in Bandung Adventist Hospital, um, Indonesia. She will talk about her personal experience about the challenges of female neurosurgeons and lecturers at educational centers in uh, uh, around the world. Her personal experience. May I please ask Dr. Sabreen to please uh, present? Um, Okay, I think I need to just hold on. In the meantime, I can call her. Maybe she's away. So this is how we have some glitches. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Simeon, can you please? Yeah, present. Yeah, okay. Okay, good evening, everyone. Congratulations. And I would like to show my respect to the professor, teacher, seniors, and colleague. Let me introduce myself. So, should I screen share now, Hira? Yes, please screen share. Yeah. Okay, can you see? No, we cannot see your screen. Uh, Yes, now we can see. Yes. Well, so can you hear us? Hira? Yes, yes, hello. We can hear you and we can uh, see your screen. Okay. You can, you can start now. Yes. Okay. My talk is going to be about the challenge of women neurosurgery at enter. It's my personal perception. If you compare me with the pre. 
still okay i guess there's some problem with her connection Okay, let me try to fix this. No, can you? Yes, we can hear you, but your voice is uh, just uh, lagging. Is there any issue with your internet? Uh, is this the same connection that we? Yes, uh, or maybe. Okay, so there is some connection problem. Wait, I will, I will, I will next. Yes. Now I'm trying another connection. Can you, can you? Okay, okay, okay. So my talk, this is my talk, it's about the challenges of the lecturer, educational center in my personal perception. Uh, I'm from Indonesia, this is my country. It's an archipelago country and I, can, I come from Bandung. It's the capital city of West Java province. So the population is about 2.5 million people. And there are five educational centers in my country for the neurosurgery training. It's in Jakarta, in Bandung, in Surabaya, in Medan, and in Yogyakarta. And from these five educational centers, there are uh, four uh, women lecturer and women neurosurgeons. This is the university and this is the public hospital that all the residents will perform their uh, surgery activities and their practice here in this public hospital. And then I go to the private hospital called Bandu Adventist Hospital because in my country, it is possible to have three uh, place to be practiced as a neurosurgeon. This is the neurosurgery department staff. The head of department is Dr. Ahmad Imran, and there are eight divisions, neurotrauma, pediatric, neurospine, peripheral nerve and pain, neurovascular, neuro-oncology, the surgery, neurofunctional surgery, and neuroinfections. There are only three women uh, in our department. The first, Dr. Mirna, she is in neuropediatric division. And then Dr. Selfie, she is in the neurofunctional surgery. And me from the neurospine and peripheral nerve and pain together with Dr. Ruli and Dr. Farid Yudoyono. So we are in the same division, but for the development of subdivisions, uh, Dr. Farid is developing the pain division now, and I'm in this last one year. I'm studying about the peripheral nerve while Dr. Ruli is still in the spine surgery and craniofemoral jun junction surgery. Neurosurgery department graduation in Pajajaran University. This university is the oldest neurosurgery training in Indonesia. There are about two. From our university. So, how to be a neurosurgeon in my country? Uh, first, after the high school, uh, a college, uh, and become a student in the medical school for about five years. When it was in my period about 2002, it took six years. And after you graduate from the medical school, you will go to the internship. And after that, you can choose the neurosurgery center that you desire. And 
you can follow the tests for the acceptance there. Me personally, actually, it was uh, it was not an easy way for me to get into this neurosurgery resident because I I was failed uh, at my first test. I took the test when I was 24 year old and then uh, they said uh, I was not mature enough to enter the program and uh, they asked me to follow another test in the future and I followed the second test and after that I make it uh, to the neurosurgery training. And after you accept in a neurosurgery uh, test and then you will face the residency program in my center it's about 5.5 years and after that you will become a neurosurgeon once you become a neurosurgeon you can decide uh, you want to work individually or in a private team or you want to become staff with the several criteria from the university or from the department that you want to join so in general uh, like uh, dr divia said professor isabel said Women issues in neurosurgery are quite many, and if we read in the internet or in a journal, the issues are about the this neurosurgery is male-dominated working field, and this work is highly physical needs. And some say women are intelligent, but they are not that smart. Still, men are smart than women. And in equality in senior positions, especially uh, in the university or in the training center. And people said uh, women are too emotionally involved in everything, like Dr. Divya said. Uh, and personal issues such as family, parenting, spouse, and environment stigma about we are being underestimated. And in my country, uh, women, doctor, uh, patient, uh, usually called us with nurse first instead of called us with doc. And uh, the other issue, this is my picture when I was in the resident program. So when I was in a residency program, there are five of us and we all graduated as neurosurgeons now. So in my centers, there are 46 neurosurgery residents and now only three of them are women. It's about 6.5%. It's a very uh, view of uh, women who enter this uh, neurosurgery training. There are 17 staff uh, from the previous picture. Uh, it was only 15, but we, we have uh, two new staff. So there are 17 of us and three of us are women. It's about 17.6%, still a uh, few if we compare to the men neurosurgeons. So in my perception, limitations and obstacles uh, for the personal problem, it's intense physically and unpredictable hours. It knows no hormones. You know, uh, women are identically with the hormones, but this working field, they know nothing about the pregnancy or your menstrual cycle. They don't want to know anything about it. And the limitations and other obstacles usually come from the family and relatives. If you are too young and you are go to your career, like in my country, in my culture, people will always ask you about how about your marriage. And if you are married and you go for your career, they ask again, who is going to look after the kids? So women in the neurosurgery or women who are pursuing their career, it's like such an aura. Stigma about neurosurgeons are rich, uh, takes these highly expectations from the family and relatives that neurosurgeons should be rich and fin financially settled. But for me, myself, I change my perception. I accept my limitations, I overcome the obstacles, and I keep focus in doing good things in neurosurgery. So fortunately, at my center, there is no difference between male or female in a working field. I'm really thankful and I really enjoy uh, working in my center and as a neurosurgeon and a lecturer too. Limitations as a woman are very personal. It depends on our point of view 
and obstacles are mainly from the culture and the environment because in my center uh, there are not so much obstacles uh, the facts at my educational center uh, why i put this kind of a diagram because if you want to pursue your career as the neurosurgeon individually you will get highly paid because you are based on number of cases you will get paid by your cases you, you and yourself after in my center it's a bit different because the payment is quite low you go to the public hospital and all the patients there are covered by the just so you will pay it by the, the health system uh, and you only focus on the cases but you have to be focused in research lectures your achievements and you have to about the new knowledge or the new skill you help the patients but the more important thing be Okay, so I guess her connection is... Yeah. Okay, Selene, we cannot hear you. Uh, can you just check on your connection? Hello, Dr. Selene, can you hear us? I guess there's some trouble with her internet. So we may just wait for a while. She can come back. So this is exactly what happens when we have trouble we have to face through the, all these things when we have online symposiums this is a limitation i guess but till now whatever lectures which we have gone through i believe that there's this uh, stigma of having a struggle to go through apart from studies um, there are many things which we need to look up when we are female neurosurgeons so i guess it's it's something much more harder when it comes to females pursuing neurosurgery so what are your comments, Dr. Nelsi, Dr. Divya? You are here. You you have been through this, so um, so like uh, in India, like um, we conduct. Uh, I conducted a survey among the women neurosurgeons in India. So around uh, like we got a good response. Around seventy nine percent responded. Actually, uh, most of them, around ninety percent, said like they have they get good support from the family. Mm -hmm. So. We do not have any child care systems in India. So we are, um, our children are taken care mainly by the grandparents. Uh, so if, uh, I, I mean, I had the question, if uh, that family support is not there, what will happen? Whether we are able to pursue, because we had some good support from the family, that's why we are still pursuing our career. If we do not get the family support, then I don't know, because it was conducted among the successful neurosurgeons and residents who are pursuing still. All of them had almost 90%, 98% had good support from the family. So actually, we have to conduct a survey only and find out. So we do not have childcare systems in India. Very difficult. No family support, you cannot pursue your career. That's what I can say. Now we have uh, Offa with us. She is, uh, she is new to the panel. Could you please introduce yourself, Offa? Okay. Hello, everybody. I am Offa XM. Uh, fourth year resident in neurosurgeon from Iraq. I am glad to meet you all of you. And um, if I want to talk about uh, women in, neuro in, in neurosurgery in my country, we are proud to have only three in, uh, certified in neurosurgeon. 
women and about 10 uh, female residents in different years. Also, we are uh, involved the medical students who are interested in neurosurgery. We made simulation lab for them. We want to connect with the weapons and uh, I hope meet each one of you someday. About obstacles, uh, as every one of you said, uh, without, family uh, without family support, we couldn't reach that. Also in my country, it is a male dominant branch uh, and not easy to be a resident in a, only a female resident in hospital. In my hospital, I am the only female. The rest of them are uh, male. That is commendable. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, now I guess Dr. Sivleen has is having troubles connecting with the. I mean, I'll just give her a try once, and if she is not able to, then we can proceed with the. Um, I'll have to check on her. But this is this is a limitation of online uh, symposiums. I mean, the more easy it is, there has there are some technicalities which we need to um, um, which we need to consider. We did introduce Umema, right? Umema, are you there? Yes, we did introduce Umema. Okay, so we proceed. We have Dr. Nelsi with us. Uh, Dr. N Professor Nelsi is a known, uh, she is the chairman of Women in Neurosurgery, the Brazilian Society of Neurological Surgeons. She is the chairman of Pediatric Neurosurgery Committee at the World Federation of Neurological Surgeons. And she is going to give a talk on uh, trend of females in neurosurgery in Brazil and in Latin America. Uh, we thank you for your time and uh, it's all yours, ma'am. Um, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. Seconds. Unmute. It's okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Hira, for the invitation. Thanks, Dr. Yoko Kato. She is bright and brilliant in our field, uh, women in neurosurgery, I think, around the world. Uh, have a lot to thank uh, Dr. Kato, she's worked a lot. And uh, I, at the beginning, I was only a neurosurgeon. I didn't work in the field of the gender field. I was the president of our Brazilian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. And suddenly uh, the WIN Committee of the World Federation invited me to talk half an hour about the women in neurosurgery in Brazil in Seoul, Korea uh, during the World Federation meeting. And uh, I wasn't uh, engaged in the field. And I need that since that time to start to look at the subject and try to see how we can do better for the residents and for the young students that are coming out. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. Uh, it's quite new for me, but uh, maybe it works. Share screen, it's okay. Share screen and try to see if it's work. Uh, it's okay for you? No, it's not yet. No? I need to share the entire screen. Uh, I shared the screen. It was only PowerPoint behind me uh, without your... Uh, okay, no, share no. the screen. No, and share the screen from there. Yes, no, it's fine. No, it's okay. And I go to the PowerPoint. It's okay? Yes, sir. Try to see if it's okay for everybody. It's okay? Yeah. Can you see? Yes, it's perfect. Okay? Yeah, perfect. Uh, perfect. Great. Uh, thanks again. It's a privilege to be here. And uh, when uh, we talk about women in neurosurgery, we need to know that it's a global phenomenon. There is a tendency to, to try to to have numerical equality of genders uh, for an indicator of development uh, for the nations. It's a global issue and uh, 
we need to know in our mind, just continue what we are talking before. Uh, it's a global tendency. The women are delayed maternity, try to be uh, professional before and uh, became mothers after. We know there is some issue we need to think about the subject. If we have time at the end, we can discuss uh, this field. We can talk about uh, when in Latin America, uh, without talking about Graziela Zuccaro, the last year she was the first woman president of the International Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. She works in Buenos Aires, Argentina, is the country uh, near to Brazil. And uh, we also was uh, involved in this uh, paper showing some uh, difficulties and some uh, results of the women in neurosurgery in Brazil uh, in 2011. Uh, Brazil is the third country in territorial uh, extension in the America, in the American continent, and we are the first larger uh, continent in, in the globe. But we have, uh, can you see and can you hear me too? Yes, yes, we can hear Okay, you. okay. Like, like most of the the countries uh, maybe we have uh, deal not only with uh, women neurosurgery but we have uh, work in the field in the basic health system we need to try to find better education try to solve social difference and deal also with violence and uh, corruption uh, but uh, this talk maybe we try to to find out who and how many we are uh, there is some chairman in neurosurgical department in our uh, country and try to find ways to improve our participation yeah, in the group. Oh. Uh, it's okay, dears? Why don't you enjoy wine yourself? She will send me some pictures of wine. It's okay, I can continue? Yes, yes, please continue. Okay. Uh, in life, uh, we were talking about uh, child care system. We have, uh, uh, besides our work, we have our family, friends, health, and spirit. We need to know our work is important. Yes, is work, but uh, work need to be uh, combined with uh, all our life for not to be broken or try to uh, run out and not going in the burnout. Uh, just to have an idea, uh, we are inside in a, in a bigger system. Uh, just to have an idea, uh, the work, the women working in Brazil are less uh, than uh, men. And uh, the salary is 25% less, but it was worse. It seems that we are improving uh, uh, not only numbers, but uh, uh, having position. This uh, may be uh, not uh, work for every country, but uh, I see some of you talking before me. Uh, even when the women are uh, the provider in the family. Uh, in our country, we spend uh, almost uh, three times uh, hours uh, household course more than our partners. Maybe we can try to teach our children to uh, work at the house more equally and try to have more time for uh, spend in our speciality. Uh, Despite the women uh, have more than 50% in the medical doctors uh, in the community in Brazil, we have only 70% of the members in the neurosurgical community. But it's uh, quite interesting if we may see since 2003 until now, uh, we have some uh, increasing numbers, but it's not uh, very, very uh, enthusiastic. If we take care uh, for this graphic only 
uh, with uh, the senior neurosurgeon, we are below 70% of uh, the total neurosurgeons. But uh, our uh, hope is in the residency program, we see uh, the re residency is uh, now uh, almost uh, 30% if we consider uh, the gender, men and women. It's uh, more than twice we are in the senior neurosurgeons. In real number, we have in Brazil more than 500 neurosurgeons in training, and uh, this is 2016. Now we have 100 women in training in Brazil. It's quite an enthusiastic number. Just so you can see the difference, uh, the total seniors neurosurgeons, we're still behind 6 7%. But if we try to see the the women residents uh, it's quite uh, encouraging uh, increase of the percentage and number uh, comparing with uh, the mains if <laughs> we uh, see only the global we are we still few numbers but probably in the in the future will be better just to show you uh, in three decades almost we didn't uh, move it we was between five and six percent for three decades and now we uh, may be younger with the time but it was the same the uh, physician in Brazil, if we see uh, 2000, 2009, and uh, 2012, the women were 37%. Uh, in 10 years, we just crossed the line. There is more uh, women in the medical school now than uh, men's. And it's still increase. It's quite uh, interesting because we need to provide opportunity for the new generation in the medical school to be attracted from uh, the neurosurgical field. Uh, who, in the past, we spent uh, a century to pass uh, the 22 to 39 percent to increase a little more than uh, 10 percent. And we see uh, now uh, we, we cross the 50% in only uh, 10 years. Uh, now I think uh, our um, increasing number will be in, in some years uh, what we gained in a century ago. Just to, to have an idea in the physicians uh, in the graphic, just to, to show that probably it's a tendency, increasing tendency, it is not a stable uh, number in half percent. And uh, we try to encourage the younger, uh, like you are doing to now, uh, sharing our time, our experience, to encourage not only the medical students, must try to encourage the residents, uh, don't give up. We know it's hard, it's tough, but if we have uh, passion, if we love what we are doing, uh, we can change behavior. Uh, the behavior by uh, himself doesn't don't move. We need to move inside ourselves, like uh, the, the colleague uh, tell. Our attitude needs to be changed and to show uh, our colleagues that we are here to win. We are not here just to play. We need to encourage medical students to accept the challenge. We need to know it's hard hours, it's many nights, many weekends. Uh, we need to be on call and working and giving classes and uh, talking with uh, colleagues. And uh, we have in Brazil, I don't know if the reality for our countries, there are leagues in the medical school the students interested in, res in neurosurgery or in neurology try to steal together and promote uh, events when we try to, uh, to help them. 
and clarified uh, about uh, the the good and uh, also the the tough things we need to uh, know when we uh, choose the surgical career and uh, stimulate the early participation for the or in study groups or in academics directory or in research centers try to to be uh, better even uh, during the medical school uh, I do my training in Rio de Janeiro, and at that time, it was uh, before me, uh, no woman win to finish uh, the training. And uh, I decide, and it was uh, my duty to finish, and it was great because at the end of my training, the invitation came to uh, stay and to work with them. But I try to do my specialization abroad. I do pediatric neurosurgical uh, training in France. And uh, it was my opportunity to, to go and to see the network, the global network. And now, maybe 20 years ago, I am uh, see, seeing that the people uh, I was with me, that was with me in training, uh, now uh, are the people uh, we are uh, working together, we are sharing uh, our work and uh, they promote our work around the world. It's very, very interesting. I spent uh, the, the first years in Besançon. It was a general uh, hospital. It wasn't one, uh, no uh, surgeon in the surgical field but it was quite interesting. I didn't see any difference. It was accepted, it was a fantastic experience. And after that, I moved uh, to Marseille, Besançon, and it was uh, my pediatric neurosurgical training there. I find my mentor in my seventh year uh, training after neurosurgery. It was, uh, it's until now, Professor Maurice Schuchs. He, he was uh, and he is one of the founders of the Pediatric Neurosurgical Society, still alive, still working, and is still uh, my mentor and a very, very good friend. Uh, we stay around the world several times, uh, sharing uh, his brave experience. At that time, I didn't knew any woman in neurosurgery to neurosurgeon uh, to be my uh, my mirror. Try to to look at somebody and see. I will be like that. It was Professor Schuchs. Uh, he showed me that. Uh, you can have good skills and be a brave man, humble, simple, and uh, do your best and uh, teach it uh, the young and uh, the colleagues. And uh, uh, in our team in Sao Paulo, it was the first neurosurgical, uh, pediatric neurosurgical team at that time uh, to be together and work together. And maybe the message, uh, try to work today like it was your last day, but still uh, working and living, uh, thinking that the life is eternal. And uh, maybe we can uh, help somebody and uh, do our best uh, every single day. And maybe tomorrow the students don't need to have a win uh, department because we will be normal and we have half to half work and uh, result bad, uh, best outcome for everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, it's uh, great and uh, we, I mean, when you see it's i think the trend is same throughout the world even if when you go to latin america it's the same but we need to appreciate here the fact that male mentors have been a good uh, encouragement for female neurosurgeons and i believe that males not all of them are the ones who are pulling us down but we have male mentors a father husbands males have a role too in creating neurosurgeons female neurosurgeons so what do you really say about that uh did you ask me a question, Hira? Yes, yes, I'm saying that when you say that your mentor, he was a male, and even today, we, like, we, we get across professors and we get across our teachers and seniors, even in our families, we have supportive males. So 
and I guess they also need to be credited uh, when it comes to um, having a successful career for females in neurosurgeons. So they do need to have a, and they do play an important part. So we need to mention this here. What are your thoughts about this? Uh, I think you can find a mentor. Doesn't matter if a man or a woman is a human being, and uh, I think it's difficult to find. But we need to search, look at uh, uh, the behavior. Uh, I spend a lot of uh, time try to find out someone that uh, I, in my mind, I was working with him at that time and i was thinking maybe in 10 or 20 years i hope i can be 10 or 20 percent uh, like that it means uh, if you encourage other people don't pull them down just uh, try to help them doesn't matter if you are helping uh, a woman or a man in neurosurgery. You are doing your best and you try to be uh, not a mirror because uh, each life, each experience, it's unique. Uh, you can uh, be in the place for our colleagues, but you can uh, give your best, do your best. And sure, somebody will try, will look at you and uh, will be inspired for your work, your thinking, and uh, uh, why not your family? Just one work in the family. Uh, I have a lot of chance. I'm married, uh, but my husband take care for more of me, maybe 99% uh, of my house and my child is uh, my husband in charge of it. He is an architect, he works behind the house. Uh, the clients uh, he can manage when uh, he takes Francisco at school and he bring back Francisco at school. Uh, if one a week I am in charge to pick up Francisco at school, he call me, Nelsie, are you aware? Are you going to take uh, the child at school? But I know it's a privilege, but the things are changing. Probably the students for today uh, will uh, have more than uh, we have now this kind of experience. Doesn't matter who uh, do more things at home. The more important is the family stay together and work together. But we have in Brazil uh, the child care uh, developed, but we need to think one uh, field not working. For example, at night and weekend, we don't have chance. If you are on call or, or if you uh, need to do uh, some uh, exceptional urgent surgery at the weekend or at night, we can uh, just interrupt you. Um, you're, you're screen sharing again. Can you just go off the screen share and we can have a look at you as you talk? Uh, yes, yes. Ah, sorry, sorry. We okay. are okay. Try to find out his yeah. left side. Yeah. The green button, yes, you clicked it again. Yes, uh, yeah. not anymore. Yeah, it's okay. Here. Now you can continue. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's perfect. Uh, we need to develop. Yes, I agree with uh, Professor Cato. In the neurosurgical meetings, we need to think that some mothers maybe came with the child. Why not provide some optional uh, for the for the childrens? Uh, the childrens is family too. We need just to think and try to to work in the field. Thank you so much, Dr. Nelsi. And uh, any questions or comments, or anyone likes to know anything about Brazilian uh, women in neurosurgery? Any of the panelists? Okay, so I guess we proceed. We have Sivlin back with us. Uh, Dr. Sivlin, can you continue with your presentation? Uh, because you got stuck in the middle. Can you continue with it? Sorry, everyone, for the inconvenience. I have to go to another working space for the connections. So I hope you can see me or hear me clearly now. Are you hear me clearly? Yes, you can. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, no, you can. I... Very well. 
Okay. Uh, I don't know where was my last point, but maybe I will start from uh, this slide. And I'm sorry if you hear any noise because I come to another working space near my house. So this neurosurgery department graduation in Fajar Jaran University, it's more than 130 neurosurgeons graduated from this university. There are about 235 uh, neurosurgeons in Indonesia. In my country, how to be a neurosurgeon? In my country, first, after the college, you have to go to the medical school. Uh, it takes five years now. In my period, in 2002, it took six years. And after that, now you have to go to the internship to the hospital by the government program. And after you finish your internship program, you can attend the test in the neurosurgery center in any center that you desire. Uh, me personally, I have my personal failure about entering this neurosurgery program. I was failed uh, in my first test. I took the test at uh, 24 years old when I was 24 years old and they say uh, I was not mature enough to enter this program. And then they asked me to join to uh, another test. And I, I follow another test six months later. I prepare myself well. And then I made it to be accepted to the neurosurgery training. So what I want to say here, failure is just an ordinary problem. The more important thing, you don't have to give up. You try and try again if you have uh, very uh, highly passionate in neurosurgery. And then after that, you can be a neurosurgeon and you can decide which one uh, you want to be, individually practice or the staff in the university. I chose to be staff in neurosurgery. And those are women issue in neurosurgery, uh, male-dominated working field, uh, highly physical needs. Women are intelligent, they say, but not that smart compared to the male neurosurgeons. And inequality in senior positions, too emotionally involved in everything like Dr. Divya said. And personal issues such as family, parenting, spouse, usually for the developing and eastern countries like my country. And environment stigma about being underestimated. Uh, you are being called by nurse instead of doc. That's what happened in my country. And this is my teacher when I was in the residency program. Is it true about all these issues? Actually, in my center, there are 46 neurosurgery residents. Three of them are women. Uh, very few of them, 6.5%. And there are 17 staff. Three are women. Uh, limitations and obstacles for me personally intense physically and unpredictable hours it knows no hormones pregnancy or your menstrual cycle this working field is very tough but uh, you can manage it you can deal with it it's not uh, that hard if you really love this uh, neurosurgery things family and relatives about um, especially for the woman in Eastern country, in my country, they will ask you first about the marriage. I give my respect to all the women that can perform the neurosurgery practice or neurosurgery training with uh, the marriage. Uh, me, myself, I cannot uh, handle with uh, these two conditions. I have to focus. I know my limitations. So. I accept my limitations, overcome the obstacles, and keep focus in doing good things in neurosurgery. I thank God that in my center, no difference between male or female in the working field. I really enjoy it so much. Limitations as a woman are personal. It depends on your point of view. And obstacles are mainly from the culture, especially in my culture, in my ethnic in Indonesia. It's about the... Uh, dependent or independency, the marriage life, kids, parenting life, stuff like that. The fact that uh, uh, the educational center, if you want to be only the neurosurgeon and you have your individual practice, you will surely will get paid high.
highly because it based on number of cases you do so much operation you will get uh, more money and actually you will help the patients and you will develop yourself from your own skills from your own cases but it's a bit different if you choose to be a lecturer because the payment in my university in my country is quite low for the lecturer you have to go to the public hospital while more than 90 percent of the patients they are covered by the general insurance so you will not get paid by the patients you will get paid by the government and you cannot focus only the cases but you have to do your research you have to do the lectures for the medical students for your residents and you have to chase your achievements and you have to keep update about the new knowledge or new skill in the neurosurgery because you have to teach someone and of course you will help the patients but the most important thing being a lecturer in my perspective it's because you will build your generations you will teach while you are doing your surgery so it makes the surgery a little bit longer a little bit more complicated and a little bit stressful because you have to responsible to the patients but you have to be ready for the students error and you cannot blame the students you cannot blame the residents they are your students and the fact is these two fields being the neurosurgery being the neurosurgeons or the lecturer at the same time you need those things in my perception you need the resilience you need the willpower you need the responsiveness you need the highly persistence especially when you got a lower payment and you have to get your call my call is not a money oriented i need money but my first uh, aim is mm, it's not money that's why when my head of department offered me uh, to be to become a staff he said the first thing to me once you decide to become a lecturer, please do not hope that you will get paid as high as uh, the individually practiced neurosurgeon. And I'm totally okay with that. I'm not rich, uh, but I'm enough with my condition. Uh, this condition comforts me well because I know my patient and I am enjoying it. As a neurosurgeon in uh, the training center, First, you cannot change the goal of the surgery. First and first is patient safety. But the advantage in the training center, you have your team. I have my mentor. I thank Dr. Ruli so much for teaching me more than four years. And my seniors, Dr. Farid Yudoyono. And if you have your teamwork, so many things that you can do together. So if you are a woman, this might be an option for you if being an individually practiced neurosurgery is too overwhelmed, especially if you have another focus in family or parenting, you need to find your team, that's my suggestion. And we have to be responsible for the student errors. We, don't, we can blame the residents. Uh, and to become a neurosurgeon, at the same time become a lecturer you have to do the right thing because you have to do the right to teach the right and money is not the first aim the first aim is your patient in neurosurgery as a lecturer because i'm still young i'm 32 years old i graduated in 2015 so uh, this talk is not about experience it's about my perception as the young neurosurgeons uh, as a lecturer, I need to read, I need to update, I need to write all the time because you have to deal with the residents. And they need to be encouraged by us because teaching is encouraging. And personally for me, this, is, this, uh, this task about encouraging is more difficult than teaching because uh, so many residents are older than me actually and they are men so 
uh, I don't know, it needs another effort from me to uh, look mature and can encourage them. So uh, this is a few of the paper that we wrote together in divisions. As a junior staff in division, uh, the main advantage that I can take uh, is psychologically burdens in any surgery are very low because psychologically you will feel secure. You know you have your team and you can do more projects you can go overseas to the conference to the workshops and you can share your responsibility here while you go overseas because you have your team back you up and i keep in my mind as a junior staff and division i cannot get all the things in one time so i have low authority but in the other hand, I have full backup from my mentor and from my senior. So another uh, philosophy things that I get from being a junior staff, the self-awareness to be loyal to the senior, it makes me have no arrogancy and it leads me to a better attitude. Because as we know, usually humors or stigma about the neurosurgeons uh, they are very proud of themselves and they said neurosurgeons are too arrogant so as a junior staff there is no way to be arrogant because i know i have my mentor or my head department my seniors above me so uh, those are the international uh, workshop or symposium that we uh, held in our division Actually, there was another uh, international workshop in 2012. We invited Professor Ramani and Professor Sushil Patkar from Mumbai, India, and from Pune, India. But I cannot show you the final announcement. Uh, this is in conjunction with the World Spinal Column Society. And then we performed another symposium and cadaver workshop in uh, minimally invasive spine surgery and anatomical dissection of thoracolumbar spine in 2015. We invited uh, Professor Hyun Sung Kim from Seoul, Korea. He is one of the advisory board of the World Columns Spinal Society too, together with Dr. Ruli. And I really thank God that uh, he opened my way to attend uh, so many meetings I present so many uh, posters, free paper presentation. Since 2011, I graduated uh, in 2015, and I took uh, one year off here. Uh, you can see I attend no meeting because I focused to my uh, board examination. So what I'm trying to tell you here, you can develop yourself as far as you want as far as you go, but you have to know your priority. When I know my priority uh, was my uh, neurosurgery board examination, I stopped all the meeting, I stopped all the presentations. And after that, after you become neurosurgeon, you can start it all over again. And what I can uh, took uh, from this uh, meetings, the network, uh the knowledge the skill uh will be rebuilt for in my perception it's about three years after consistently being in this scientific meeting continuously so this is my perception obstacles challenges limitations they are very different Obstacles, they usually put by other people. You have to do it and get through it to survive. Sometimes it put to block you. So like Dr. Divya said, don't get too emotionally involved, don't get too personally. Just overcome the obstacle, chill, and think about the way out and you can handle it in neurosurgery training. And don't ever give up. 
But the challenges, this is the one that we should take personally because we encounter it by ourselves. And we don't have to do it, but if we have to do it, it can make us a better person. So I see uh, challenges to test me to be a better person. But the limitations for me, it's naturally there. Like the uh, social stigma about women and marriage, there's nothing I can do to change it. So I have to accept it. And limitations are needed to keep us uh, on the ground. So we can dream higher, we can chase any achievements far, but those limitations will keep us humble and keep us on the ground. So uh, this is when we are, we are as a resident. Uh, Dr. Selfie, uh, she is together with me as my senior in the department. So the challenges for me personally, in my perception, because I am less than three years graduated as neurosurgeon, so I don't think uh, I'm capable enough to uh, say it my experience. This is my perception. Gender is not a big issue in my center, so the challenges are about my self-satisfaction. I try to see from the positive side and the big issue in my department uh, about the limitations of high technology instruments. Uh, it's a common problem in developing countries. Uh, so my mentor, uh, Dr. Ruli, developed our skills in the private hospital where the instruments are possible. For example, there is no way we can perform the minimal invasive spinal surgery in my center because uh, it's about uh, challenging with the orthopedic uh, department. Uh, so we don't have the MISS instrument in the public hospital. So we developed the MISS uh, technique in the private hospital, in the Bandung Adventist Hospital. So if there is another MISS surgery, we will invite uh, some of the residents uh, to see and we teach the residents in the private hospital too. Residents are so many, they need to learn. So I have to keep update myself. I push myself to regularly read the journal because I know I cannot uh, read it every day, but I push myself maybe minimum two, maximum three journals every week. And then I attend national and international conference or workshop. And then I share the knowledge to the residents because they cannot go to the scientific meeting as frequent as we can go. And the most important thing about uh, being a woman, especially if you are not getting married, like my condition, I have to be financially settled because it is very important. So I really, really wise in spending, so I still can attend the international course. And it makes me uh, keep my spirit and passion in neurosurgery. So I just only enjoy my work, not because I need the money, but because I love and enjoy the work. So that's uh, my presentations, uh, thank you. Thank you. That was a really wonderful presentation, Dr. Sylvie. And it's uh, it's good to know the aspects of future in neurosurgery when it comes to making a choice between becoming a neurosurgeon, a practicing clinical neurosurgeon, or choosing the field of uh, academics and lecturer. Any comments? Any questions uh, among the panelists? Anyone? Um, uh, like I just want to make a comment. Like. Uh... Uh, like uh, she's a mentor, like lecturer, and she takes the responsibility of uh, the error of the student. So that's great. Great to hear. <laughs> You're a good mentor. Thank you, Dr. Dilhu. Okay, thank you. We proceed with our next uh, presentation. Dr. Sharon, do we have you with us? Hello. Uh, Dr. Sharon, uh, we cannot see. Dr. Sharon, are you there? Yeah, you're muted. Can you unmute, please?
Can you can you unmute your mic, please? All right. Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah. Now you can hear me? Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Let me, let me introduce you and then you can continue with your presentation. Okay. Uh, Karen Kasalda with us. She is a consultant neurosurgeon, uh, Sultana Anina Hospital, and senior lecturer, Monash Malaysia Medical University. She will be highlighting on the journey, challenges, and future of female neurosurgeons in Malaysia and Southeast Asia. Welcome, Dr. Sharon. Okay. Um, good day to everyone. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm a bit sorry because I can't seem to be uh, I can't seem to screen share my. PowerPoint because I have some problem with internet. I'm actually on holiday. So um, anyway, I was called during my flight actually in, in transit to get to do this. So it's a quick thing I'm doing. Um, I'm going to talk about actually the journey, okay, because uh, Malaysia neurosurgery for women in neurosurgery, uh, it's pretty new. It's been almost about 15 years because that's how long I've been in the program and uh, as a neurosurgeon. And um, uh, and after that, we've had quite a rapid um, uh, growth in the women in neurosurgery in Malaysia, which is quite good. And um, so this is just a short presentation. I don't know whether whether it's okay. Can you all like sort of see this or do I need to, um, is it okay? Can you all see it? Can you see it? Can you all see that? I'm not sure. Or do I just, can you see it? Is it okay? Or is it upside down? No, it cannot. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, I think, but only the half of the screen is seen. All right. Let me see now. All right. Is that okay? Is there a whole screen yeah, yeah, seen? Yeah, yeah, it is okay. It is okay. All right. Okay. So, um, let me go to the next one. All right. So, in Malaysia, there is about 9% uh, of neurosurgeons who are women. Uh, this is in the last 15 years. All right. And the number are board certified is about slightly less than. Uh, mm -hmm. Seven percent. You couldn't see clearly. Uh, sorry, Dr. Sharon, to in, uh, interrupt. Uh, it is not seen clearly. Uh, no. Words, but... No. It's. Can it's you shaking. see it? No. The screen is no? shaking. Shaky. Yeah. No. No. Okay. No. No. I think maybe <laughs> we can listen to what you say. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. It's it's a bit shaky. Your uh, if if you put your cell phone somewhere in a steady stable place, it's going to be fine. Or you can do one thing, uh, Dr. Sharon, can you send me the PowerPoint? Can you email it to me and I'll just share it uh, with the screen? Okay. And then... Okay, here are the thing is, I was trying to do that for myself, but I think maybe because my PowerPoint is very large, it doesn't want to go through Google. Okay. I have to uh, Google drop it and it still wouldn't go through. All right, so that's the problem. So what I can do is I can just go through it. I can just do a. I, I'm okay. You don't have to look at my. You don't have to look at the pictures. It, it's not important. I think the main thing is about sharing. All right. So I'll just uh, continue talking, and I think everybody can just listen in. And if they have anything, then they can continue to ask me. All right. Sure. Yes. Oh, okay. So it's. Uh, I'll make it quite sweet and short because I think I've I've listened to what the few of the first speakers have spoken and if I'm going to go through this whole thing again I think it's going to be a redundant because basically what we are trying to show is how we all can work as women neurosurgeons in this world so uh, what I'll do is just uh, because if I, I I think my PowerPoint presentation is going to be almost the same as what the last few speakers have done so um, so what I do is I'll just get mine straight to the point and then after that if there's any questions then I think we can you know, you can go in and ask me questions. So, like I said, there's nine percent of us who are neurosurgeons in uh, nine percent of female female neurosurgeons in Malaysia, and um, it's the board certified is slightly less, about seven percent. But it takes about about two to three years to get board certified in Malaysia after you graduate. And I think looking at the numbers in Malaysia, it is sort of the same as what is standing in the world at the moment, um, about the same. Uh, and uh, we have one neurosurgeon at the moment, a female neurosurgeon, who is actually on medical leave due to uh, medical reasons. So otherwise, all the women neurosurgeons are full on and working. Uh, the number of women who are applying for the residency program in Malaysia in uh, 2016 is actually 40% of the uh, total of women who uh, total of residents applied were women. And uh, surprisingly, in 2014. Uh, the final exams for residents 
there were three women and one male in that group. So, I mean, you can see that it does happen that we do have a lot of women who are joining into neurosurgery program in Malaysia recently. Um, we started off, uh, neurosurgery in Malaysia started off in the 1960s, was brought in by an American from uh, United States. And um, so we had our uh, first male neurosurgeon in Malaysia in the 60s, 69. And uh, from then on, it has been growing. So when I joined the program, that was in 2004. So it's been like almost 40 years later for uh, Malaysia to have a woman neurosurgeon join into the uh, neurosurgery world. Um, I was lucky when I joined in because uh, my, uh, my head of department or my boss was very encouraging. Um, very positive towards me. They encouraged me. So I've had this question asked to me many times. In fact, about two weeks ago, I had this confab with medical students and they asked me about being a surgeon and being a woman. So I told them, actually, when I joined the program, I never envisioned myself as being a, a, a woman joining into the program. I just looked at this as a doctor who wanted to do neurosurgery. And I was lucky that no one ever made me feel that, you know, that I was a woman doing neurosurgery. Uh, I entered the residency program in 2004. I was in neurosurgery from 2000, so I entered the program after four years later. There's a system in Malaysia where you have to have a few years of experience in neurosurgery before you can actually enter the program. Uh, when I entered the program, I was married, so I had no problems from my husband. He encouraged me because he is an orthopedic surgeon, so I guess maybe we didn't have much issues there because he's also a doctor. And um, when I joined in, the only thing that I found was interesting is the question that was asked to me during my interview, uh, we go through the normal questions, you know, your, your, your medical based questions, your scenarios and things like that and what you've done in your papers and stuff. But the interesting question that was put to me was by one of the professors was if I was, uh, I had a surgery done and uh, in that surgery, um, I finished my surgery and I went home and it happened that I was having an anniversary dinner with my husband at a very posh uh, uh, restaurant. And then I got called out because my patient, which I operated on earlier, had a bleed. I mean, it was a tumor and he had a re-bleed. So he said, what would you do? Would you leave your dinner and go back or would you stay for your dinner? I, I thought it was absolutely a ridiculous question and I thought it was very gentle. But then of course I answered the question, my patient is always important and that would be my priority. But that was the only thing that I realized was a bit different when I first joined in the program. And, um, and then I, I noticed uh, because I was the first woman joining into the program, they had a lot of misconceptions. However, I was lucky by the uh, first six months, the feedback to my uh, boss, my head of department from the professors was that uh, they were totally, uh, it was totally different. They didn't think uh, they had misconceptions about a woman joining the program, but after six months, it totally changed their mind. So everything went well and I graduated and, and now I practice as a neurosurgeon in my center. I'm the senior consultant there. I have uh, residents that come and train under me and uh, they are both men and women. And um, personally, if we are, I, I, I still do not know why we should be debating about this situation because I think at the moment with the residencies, residents that work with me, I believe that men have same problems as women. And social, uh, the trend of social and economy is changing in this world. Uh, men, no, it's not only women who take care of their children, it's also uh, men. And I think uh, there are times when um, the women or the wives expect their husbands to also contribute. So I noticed the residents in my uh, department, even though they are male, they still have their own issues and it's not a woman's issue at all anymore. So um, it's, it's weird. I have uh, uh, my men residents, male residents coming up to me and saying, uh, can I take uh, a day off because I need to go back? My uh, kid is not well and my wife, is, uh, my wife can't handle it. So it's not like what it used to be where, you know, it's the woman. And I have had women residents with me and some of them are very good. So I, I feel that it's how you balance your time and, and how you balance your work life. And it's how you... Uh, organize your priorities in life. So um, basically, there are about uh, 13 or 14 of us now in the uh, neurosurgical uh, women neurosurgeons in Malaysia. Um, I should say 40% are married, 60% are not married. Um, why they are not married, uh, that is the other question because sometimes, um, you know, 
uh, being maybe they focused on their on their work a lot and then they don't don't mix around a lot i'm not sure some of them you know uh, maybe this this we we should encourage them also to have a life outside neurosurgery which i do often tell them i say look at the colleagues who do have families and who are very successful at their work so don't think that to be a good neurosurgeon you have to remain single um, there is of course uh, it is surprisingly because in Asia nowadays, you notice there's no more this taboo where a woman cannot, uh, you know, is supposed to be at home and take care of children. I notice we are going away with it. Like our last speaker, she's just like what she said, we are going away with it. Uh, we have no problems here. Uh, the male uh, counterparts are very supportive. And um, you know, we, are, we are actually encouraging, uh, they are encouraging us to do better. So I think there's no, no issues. And... Um, and uh, so I think we shouldn't think about that. Oh, if I want to be a neurosurgeon, that I sacrifice a lot of my normal life. No, you don't have to. I mean, maybe when you're a resident, you need to put your mind and heart into it. But when you become a neurosurgeon, then you need to know how to, uh, you know, manage your time well. So um, I think um, how do we advance? The main thing is, I think, like what we talk about, mentoring is very important. Uh, you know, leadership training and negotiating skills. These are the two things that are most important. And um, I think all these skills are not gender specific. These skills are actually uh, more of a, a general thing. So if you have it, you have it. And um, so I think we shouldn't address it as, okay, this is a woman's problem or this is a man's problem. Now it's everyone's problem. So it's, it's, it's better. We have to remember that to be a, a neurosurgeon, you have to be honest, dedicated, and then you become a neurosurgeon. It's not about being a woman. It's more of becoming what you want to be by being honest and dedicated to your work. So if you're that, I believe, and you love what you do, there's no barriers. And um, in, inherently, uh, this is a demanding field. And uh, of course, we cannot expect uh, changes to attract or accommodate us as women, but we should be willing to master and advance in the field. Uh, so I guess that's, that's all. I'm, I'm very sorry about my, my, my PowerPoint. I couldn't share it with you all. They actually have a lot of pictures of the women in neurosurgery with their family and their lives and they're actually supposed to encourage you all more women to take on neurosurgery. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much, Dr. Sharon. Thank you for your efforts. I, mean, I completely understand uh, your problems. It was a great presentation. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, any questions, any comments from the uh, panel? Okay, so we basically have Anira Darwar with us. Uh, welcome, Dr. Anira. You, um, she is uh, from Pakistan, diplomat, American board neuro neurosurgeon. She's a chairperson of Women in Neurosurgery Pakistan, and currently she's a program director, assistant professor, and a consultant at the Department of Neurosurgery at Aga Khan Hospital. She will uh, give her insights to what is holding women back. So, Dr. Anira, it's all yours. Please. Uh, 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 hello, uh, everyone, uh, and hi, Hira. And uh, I hope you guys can hear me properly. Unfortunately, I'm not in my hometown. I am in Amsterdam, and uh, therefore I don't have my earplugs. But I hope everybody can hear me properly. Can you just uh, manually put your camera down so we can see it? Yes, that's, that's fine. Yes, that's fine. Okay, great. And I want to share my presentation now, so I'm just going to go ahead and share it. Okay, can everybody see my presentation? Hello? Yes, we can, yes, yes, we can see. Okay. Can you see my face or just the presentation? I can see your presentation, your screen sharing now. Okay, all right. So um, I'm going to uh, give you my perspective of uh, what I had gone through my life as a neurosurgeon. And uh, I feel the situation in Pakistan is not very encouraging as compared to the situation in other parts of the world. And uh, so I'm going to just uh, share my own experiences for my last five years in Pakistan. So uh, this is uh, uh, one cartoon that I, I love the most because uh, it just tells you that uh, uh, for the same distance, a woman has to endure so much more as compared to a male. 
and this is not a uh, particular to neurosurgery as you know uh, in any corporate world or in any kind of competitive world it remains the same so as in neurosurgery so we know it is a, a vigorous competitive demanding field and we also know that women holding a scalpel is substantially low in the world and uh, i uh, love sharing this picture because this is ms diana back uh, who was the first female neurosurgeon in the world uh, from uh, queen square london and uh, she actually for quite a bit uh, used to dress herself as a as a man uh, because and, and, for, and for a long time people actually did not know that she was actually a female neurosurgeon Uh, but in the end she of course came out so i just want to let you know that we have come from this stage to now and these are the two women that i have seen uh, you know everybody knows both of them and they are role models to rise uh, in corporate ladders uh, or in any kind of uh, leadership uh, ladders so is this all that a woman need to sort of uh, become uh, successful or be higher in the leadership position uh, i actually tend to disagree uh, because uh, this is uh, these are virtues that male and female equally have um, but uh, what i feel in as far as my career goes that uh, uh, women have to work twice to three times harder uh, to achieve to the same level as compared to a man and this is some of the stats that i had gathered last year and these are the practicing uh, uh female neurosurgeons in the world and this is one i got from the abns data but the last one was from 2010 abns is the american board of neurosurgery last one was 2010 uh, at that time there were 219 uh, female neurosurgeons in the us the pakistani stats are that uh, so far we have 10 practicing consulting neurosurgeons throughout pakistan and uh, since i am the chairperson so i keep uh, uh, updating my census and we have about 10 female residents right now throughout pakistan so 20 total we have our aga khan university where i work our experience is that uh, there there had been no female neurosurgery resident that had ever been graduated since the inception of this program and uh, the uh, currently we have about 3 female neurosurgical residents and one of them would be actually graduating by the end of this year so we'll be very happy and uh, every year what i have started noticing uh, since i have arrived at our khan university is that the number of females who wants to rotate with me or who wants to do neurosurgery residency is increasing and i completely agree that when once there's a role model uh, uh and uh, if men and women both are sensitized to the role model and things starts to change then uh these are the two men in my life who have uh, given me the chance uh to become where i am right now dr charles j hodge was my program director in upstate new york in syracuse and dr james hozapel who is uh, at the chem university right now if these two people would not have believed me uh, i would not have be where i am my father of course is one of the major persons who have helped me so i it's so funny and so contradictory that uh, uh, in in the careers of female there are males who actually help them but there are also other males who actually pull them down and so you have to constantly fight this battle uh you know to uh, that somebody will take you up and somebody will bring you down and uh, um this was uh, uh this was i had prepared this about last year but the things have changed since yeah so i have bought this just to show that uh, now we have role models uh many role models throughout the world and many many more female neurosurgeons are entering the critical mass is increasing there are more and more medical students in the medical school class and the the gender parity has started to happen in the world uh, there was a time when there was no female neurosurgeon who was the president of AANS which is American Association of Neurosurgeons but now we do the uh, Dr Shelly Timmons uh, is uh, Simmons is the one who is the president of the AANS and now we have 
board directors who are neuro, uh, female neurosurgeons. This thing has been uh, slowly, surely advancing and changing. But the only problem is that I had moved from this world to a third world country about five years ago, and all that changed for me. Dr. Yako Koto is my uh, my absolute uh, idol in neurosurgery because she has fought quite hard into the male-dominated society. And this is her uh, motto that I always remember, which she says, be assertive and ask for what you want. Because many a time, as females, we usually shy away from things. And uh, uh, these are famous women who have been given these names, uh, but they, it did not stop them from becoming who they are. And uh, many neurosurgeons, uh, females, especially the ones who have uh, done neurosurgery training in about 20 years ago must have exactly faced the same situation. Um, so I actually believe that men are from Mars and women are from Venus and a male neurosurgeon is a different uh, ball game completely than a female neurosurgeon. And, uh, uh, but again, uh, the mentality may be different, but a cordial and collegial relationship can absolutely be struck with your own colleagues. These are my other two mentors that uh, who have also helped me a lot in uh, developing my career. But when I came back to Pakistan, this is the problem that I had faced over here. And that's what I feel, at least in Pakistan, these are some of the issues that are actually holding a female back in the neurosurgery. So number one is that in Pakistan, we are a very uh, we are third world country. It's quite a high patriarchal society. And uh, there, the so the image of a woman is, uh, uh, no, it's, it's such that most men want women to go into nurturing professions. And even mothers are like that. It's not just fathers. Even the mothers want that their girls should go into a nurturing profession like a pediatrician or uh, maybe internal medicine doctor, something which is not too time consuming because the reason is they always feel that um, uh, they have to be married and they have to have children one day. And, uh, and what will people say if a woman spends more time at work and not with her family? And, uh, and, and that's the reason that uh, the, a lot of women neurosurgeons are not coming up in Pakistan. And uh, as you know, a woman walking through hospital in scrub is mostly assumed to be a nurse the first, then a surgeon. And similar situation also exists in third world countries. Other reason that I feel uh, that the holding the women back is the work-life balance. So women uh, try to balance both their careers and family, and they are often condemned for one or another. So a woman with a baby or a small child who is working 90 to 100 hours a week is criticized for being a bad mother, or a surgical resident who choose to take maternal leave will be judged for the decision too. Um, and uh, uh, nowadays in Western society, yes, there's a lot of supportive environment that's been given, maternity leaves are in place, uh, there is child support system there too, but not, not much such things exist in the place where I am right now. So that also sort of tips the work-life balance here. And even if the female decides against all odds that no, she wants to become uh, a, a neurosurgeon and she somehow uh, faces the male dominated field and faces the challenge. But I still feel that here, in general, the, the society, the culture is such that we are still looked as a second class citizens. And uh, uh, the and the bias against uh, the women are not understood, it's not respected. Whenever there, there is a, cons a consideration for a leadership position, most of the time they are overlooked. Um, and, and their male colleagues at the same time are quite widely recognized. The salary scale is even different for women with the same position as compared to the males. So th these are also some of the factors that clue in. Then the other problem that is the is the, is the, uh, the the women are mostly objectified and in professional setting I feel that 
uh, when a woman presents herself in a less feminine way, she she is more accepted by the male colleagues. And the reason, as we know, that uh, globally media creates this perception uh, of women and 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 how uh, the billboards, you know, objectifies women. We know that sex sells. And I feel that this perception also creeps into the workplace, and uh, and that's how the uh, the women are regarded in the workplace too. And I feel female neurosurgeons who wear makeup or dresses fashionably is often dismissed, and her abilities are belittled. Uh, and because I feel that the the social perception is equated uh, with the with objectifying her more so than anything else. Um, then there is, of course, all the misogynistic influences that happen. And uh, an experienced female surgeon once said that surgery may, uh, made a man out of uh, me. So I feel that the bias against the women is never a competency issue. It's always about this cultural inbred idea, especially in patriarchal societies, that a woman will never perform well or will never be accepted as a man would. Uh, sometimes we are ostracized that we are too emotional, we are too caring, and that if, and that sort of, as per the attitude, is uh, you know, giving away our professional life. And as a result, women try to acclimate. And uh, that is the only sole purpose to acclimate. It's easier to be a part of the herd than be a black sheep. Uh, the gender bias. So this is one thing that I've also faced here much more so than I have faced in the Western world. And, uh, and I feel that gender bias does not solely derive from the workplace, but also from the patient's perspective. Uh, many a times I uh, have been told uh, in front of the families that uh, we do not want to get operated by a woman. Um, and I also feel that uh, in our society, when a female surgeon makes a mistake, it is magnified much more so. And again, if the same mistake is made by a male, it is usually swept under the carpet. And uh, I feel that this culture is so deep rooted that it cannot be changed quickly. And uh, what we are doing by starting a conversation, I think is the is, is the best and best first step uh, for at least uh, women in this part of the world. Um, I also uh, I also want to uh, add this gender bias bit and the reason one big other reason in Pakistan uh, for the gender bias is uh, of our own medical health system. So in Western world, uh, patients usually have a quite a faith in their own medical system. So I remember when I was practicing in St. Louis, I had never felt ever that my patient is uh, not getting operated by me because I'm a woman. Uh, but in Pakistan, I, I feel this now and again, again and again. And uh, um, the Pakistani culture is such that because of uh, the non-belief in their own medical system, there's a culture of second opinions. So there is like one, two, three, seven second opinions a patient or patient family would seek uh, just to reach to a particular diagnosis. And uh, and when a woman comes into the picture, it, it also completely change uh, the dynamics. So I think one of the big reasons is also this um, in at least this part of the world. Then the harassment issues. So even, in, and we all have been talking about this, it's been everywhere in the media. Um, and I just feel that even institutions who have anti-harassment policies, they fail to follow them. Um, and the reason is sometimes we all know that the person who harasses is actually either a boss or a professor or a person in a very high position. And the problem in Pakistan is that the Pakistani culture makes a women afraid to come out uh, and uh, describe the personal incidences. And the reason is because uh, there's this whole idea that if public knowledge would come out that they have been either sexually harassed or something, their image will be tainted. And when the image is tainted, the family feels shamed 
uh, the family feels that who's going to uh, marry my daughter now. Uh, and usually if situations like that happens and comes out in public, they usually just bundle their daughter away and uh, send her to another part of the world instead of fighting it, fighting for their own daughters or fighting for their own sisters. So uh, in Pakistan, again, I feel that a lot needs to be done. Um, uh, men need to support women into uh, the harassment issues that happens in the hospital and the workplace. And the two examples that I want to give is one of the Australian surgeon, Dr. Caroline Tan. I think she's quite well known. And uh, she, when she, she had complained about her senior colleague, not only she was shunned, but uh, she could not even get job into other multiple hospitals that she had applied. And uh, when she had asked uh, that why uh, she was shunned and uh, the answer given to her was that, what do you expect when you dress this way? So again, this so again the society portrayal of female gender, uh, it's still there. Um, it's not completely resolved. And I have it in Pakistan, but I here there's an Australian neurosurgeon, the American neurosurgeon who was the first fine female neurosurgeon in in um, in the Brigham and Women. She also uh, complained, and uh, the hospital actually tried uh, to uh, quiet her down and uh, by giving her a settlement, and she refused the settlement because she believed that if the hospital kept paying women off who come forward with harassment claims, then the issue would never be resolved. And so she took a stand and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, she, she won the claims. And in light of her victory, uh, many other women actually came up and uh, came up with their own issues and their own harassment policies. So I feel that uh, uh, moving forward, um, we need to change and make the working environment for women more welcoming. But I feel it will not happen until unless the male are sensitized. What I feel is that the new generation, especially people in their 30s and people in their 20s, are quite different from the generations who are in 40s and 50s. Uh, there's quite a bit of gender parity I see in the in 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 my residents who are in the 30s or in their 20s as compared to my bosses. And uh, I feel that a woman, uh, if the women keep molding themselves just to be a part of the herd, then we will never progress in reality. We will just continue to mold ourselves and we'll, our issues will never come up and never be discussed. And we may have to fight an uphill battle. Just maybe our entire lives will just be able to prove that we that you have to accept us in our own entirety and we will not we will never change and uh, um, i did that my entire career um, because when i started my neurosurgery residency i would uh, i would wake up at 5 in the morning and i would wear lipstick and you know i would wear makeup and i would go and i refused to change myself and i said if one has to accept and then you have to accept us the way we are and um, and I just feel that the truth of the matter is that we do live in a sexist society, but the perception is changing. The, uh, the effort to talk about it should be continued and it should never be halted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anina. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. I completely agree with what every single word you said. It's, uh, but but true to the fact that there is a controversy that when at one side you have males who are pushing you up and there are some who are pulling you down. So you need to focus on both who are inculcating that positive energy and then you need to ignore the ones who are pulling you down. I guess that is a very important message. Yeah, yeah, I think because I I personally think that in Pakistan still the situation is that uh, for uh, many a times a woman uh, to succeed or a woman who really wants to make a name for herself, they will always, she always needs a sort of a male who has to come and agree that she is good. So I, up till here, I have not reached a stage so far here that, you know, uh, I'm just accepted the way that I am. Even if I have to, uh, if I have to shift a, a job or a position, 
a male is going to ask a male and says, oh, is she good enough or not? So it seems that my skills doesn't matter. Whatever I have done, it doesn't matter. My two fellowships, my residency doesn't matter, right? All it matters is that male's opinion, right? And I cannot fight it. So I've stopped fighting it altogether. I am just going to do what I need to do. Uh, I am just going to stand on my own beliefs and I am just going to be myself and I'll never change myself and people have to accept you. And we need to do that to change the system. It will happen only very slowly, a bit by bit, but each one of us has to play a part in it. True, true, very true. So any comments, any other suggestions, anyone from the panel would like to ask or comment on Dr. Anira's Hello, thank you, Dr. Anela. Uh, your presentation does really represent even the situation in Morocco. Here, women are being more judged for anything they do, even if they're not, they're just being judged. If you wear something, you, you wear a short skirt or you wear anything, you're going to be judged for you, you, you're the one who trigger it and you always the one who, who, who's blame it. I think your presentation did really represent the situation even here in Morocco. In the medical field, I'm still a medical student. I haven't seen really something that's the sexiest or something that goes with it. And I don't know, maybe, maybe it won't be the same thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. That Congratulations, was Anila. Fantastic talk. It's hard to talk about, but it's necessary to work out on it. But you are right. It's a uh, all culture, all society involved on it. Maybe uh, not fight again against all staffs, but maybe focus in one thing or maybe one situation where we have more possibility to win. If not, we will waste all our energy in this kind of fight for uh, the community and we forget ourselves and it's hard work but step by step i can tell you i feel like you are telling now uh, two decades ago now it's a bit different but it's better but it's not the solution not yet sure we are improving but we need to be patient because the society need to be with us is step by step. We need to raise our children with this uh, uh, behavior, open mind, and try to, to do our best for the next generation, but not accept every kind of aggression and uh, think that it's okay, it's okay, it's like that. No, but try to choose where what the condition we can fight and maybe the best way is uh, be a winner try to work in your science and your field and also work in the society in the neurosurgical society in the medical association in the win group and you will feel stronger and supportive with uh, uh, sharing your experience and helping the youngest Congratulations. Very tough talk. Thank you so much. And I completely agree with you that as females, we have to choose our own battles. Not every battle can be fought. And choose your battles and take one step at a time. Make the critical mass. Uh, bring, bring more female uh, surgeons. The, the more the number increases, the more powerful we're going to become. Sure. Great. Congratulations again. Thank you. I I want to add for, uh, I want to add that and highlight the role of the model. I was introduced to the author by my professor, and she's a pioneer in her and so on. And she's the one who, who inspired me uh, for, for the, in the beginning. I was thinking, how can I be a neurosurgeon? I'm still a medical student. This is not something that may, that neurosurgery may be an obstacle for my personal life or my marriage in the future. But she showed me that it is possible. So I just want to highlight the, role, the, the importance of having a model and having a mentor and especially women 
to, to, to guide you through, through your career. It is something that is really important, I think. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the symposium, and I guess I'm finishing on time. So I would like to pay special thank you to everyone who took their time despite their traveling and everything. It was a wonderful event, and I'm thankful to you all to make this a big success. And we will continue to hold this. A big thanks to Professor Kato. I wish she would hear, she would be here and join us, but she has some commitment. So she. Um, she is the one who has given us this opportunity, and I am proud to be organizing this. We will continue to have these in the future. Hopefully, every month we will hold a symposium, and we tend to have more and more female neurosurgeons come up and share their experiences and give us their opinions and advices. And by some time, we will have a strong women in neurosurgery community for the ACNS. We will shortly open our registrations as well for young female neurosurgeons. They can register themselves. And we will continue to update them. I'll uh, send you the links and the website so you can circulate among your own regions. And uh, we'll form a community of female in US. Thank you all. And Great. this is all from our side. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so Thank much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.